module five for intro to the psychology of consciousness or psychology of consciousness as is reported in a different syllabus. Today, we will talk about a lot of things. Um, and as usual, I would like to thank all of you for your engaging conversation via email and through the comments and through the posts um, and for all the questions that you have asked. Um, I am really um, enthusiastic about this rapport that we established because it gives me the chance to, well, first of all, review the materials that I sometimes pre-recorded or at least the slides that I utilize in each video and complement those slides with an open conversation, which I hope is uh, nurturing to uh, all of us on, on both sides of this uh, imaginary divide that separates us, the video on one side where I am here teaching you and talking to you, and on the other side, you're receiving the, the piece of information that I am sharing. So uh, psychology of consciousness, uh, this time moving in two different directions. Um, I also like to be a little more personal today. Um, I feel that a lot of the content that I shared with you previously has been very, um, very uh, theoretically constructed. And so the downside of that is that uh, sometimes you miss the personal touch. So I hope to do that today and continue to do that in the uh, next few uh, weeks uh, by virtue of perhaps simplifying things a little bit, uh, not to insult your intelligence, but simply to get to the point uh, maybe in the first part of each lecture and then elaborate on that. So, um, and I'm gonna do this by trying my best to answer some of the questions that uh, some of you have asked, uh, especially via email. The first question is, how, get, how can we pick between science and spirituality? That was one of the questions, one of the many questions uh, framing in different ways, but um, attempting to asking the same thing. Um, so let's try to understand where consciousness, which is the primary things we're studying, that consciousness, consciousness can be divided, or it has to be divided between things such as science on one side and spirituality on the other side. Okay? Now, uh, less uh, theory, less philosophy or etymolo etymological analysis this time about these two words, um, and of course, you, within science, you can represent a variety of things. And within spirituality, you can represent a variety of things. Um, and you can also misrepresent a variety of things, which is a tricky thing. Um, but the question really means, how do we know what we know and what method should we use to understand consciousness? So let's, let's start from a, a broader perspective. And today, I would like to start with an overall discussion first, and then we'll venture into some of the examples that uh, I always like to provide in terms of how we study that scientifically, how we study consciousness scientifically. I mentioned a few theories and, and, and modalities last week. So today I'll talk a bit about uh, things such as neuroimaging, neuroengineering, and stuff like that. Um, and then I will change a little bit gears and talk about some of the modalities within philosophy or within more of a uh, interpretation Based like discussion. So um, one of the first things I mentioned this semester was, uh, well, if we don't know anything else about ourselves, well, we can find something that tells us whether we are alive or not. And I mentioned action potential. I mentioned the spiker box. I mentioned the electrochemical uh, uh, neurotransmission uh, modality of the brain, all of which can, at the very least, infer that something happens. But I would like to take a step back now and one of the most common examples of this debate, let's call it duality debate or dualism, two different options, is the very old, uh, well, not that old relatively to the history of humanity, but old in terms of how many times it has been discussed, dualism by René Descartes, okay? René Descartes, okay? Which is also known as Cartesian, Cartesian dualism, okay? Dualism, okay? Cartesian because uh, his last name, despite being French, very often is uh, uh, cited as uh, in, in the Latin uh, or Latinized version, Cartesius, rather than Descartes. 
So the dualism, the separation between mind and matter. And you should remember this when we discuss uh, multiple ways to approach reality. One, which will be dualism, two things, separation between mind and matter. One, uh, idealism, and one, the tripartite uh, uh, non-locative property that can be defined as either um, essential or existential. So for instance, mind matter and the third element, okay? But Descartes is very often known in a more pop philosophy area as the scientist, the philosopher, the researcher that utilized the term cogito ergo sum. If you want to use the ecclesiastical pronunciation or cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, okay? I think therefore I am, I put the personal pronoun first person singular in parenthesis because in Latin as well as in many other Italic languages, especially Roman languages, you don't need the pronoun because the verb uh, is already telling you who's speaking. Now, Descartes was not the first person to uh, come up with this explanation. Very similar explanation exists since the dawn of uh, human history. Perhaps the closest in modern times to uh, Descartes would be the version of the so-called hanging man, the hanging man by the master Avicenna. Okay? or Ibn Sina, who was this Persian, Muslim, Unani, polymath that discussed everything from medicine to philosophy, to theology, to physics, to mathematics, and everything in between. So let me explain a little bit what this means. Um, let me start with Avicenna, just to pay respect to the historical order of things, because Avicenna, of course, Avicenna is older than uh, the cards. But it's something that has been part of human history for time immemorial. So this metaphor, or rather this image of the hanging man, is the one of a human being that was, so to speak, suspended in time and space. So his arms, his hands did not touch anything. His legs, his lower limbs did not touch anything. His back, his head, his neck, nothing touched anything. So the point of this image is to say that this man could not be certain of the existence of anything else in the universe because, again, he did not have direct empirical evidence of the existence of anything because he wasn't able to touch anything. Uh, and we could, you know, use other senses as well. He was able to see anything. And therefore, the only thing he was certain is that he was not everything else, which is very similar to say that I don't know whether there is anything else around me, but I am conscious of the fact that at the very least I'm thinking, which is, in my estimation, much more complicated, sorry, much less complicated than what certain modernist scientific perspectives would like us to think. Why is that? Because sometimes we can trust our intuition. Sometimes we can trust that it's provided by personal experiential knowledge. So if I'm thinking about something, I might never ever get to the full knowledge of the existence of something. I might always self-doubt as in, am I interpreting this situation correctly? Is what I'm seeing really what's out there? Is what I am perceiving with my senses, with my memories, the truth or the only thing I can sure of is the fact that I am doubting, okay? This is a very skeptical position, which is a very healthy position when you approach anything scientific. If you don't know anything, you should always suspend judgment and be in a state of awe and admiration. This is really, by the way, the true etymology of a miracle, right? You're surprised in a higher scientific, higher um, awareness sense, okay? 
It comes from mirare, so to observe, to look at, to see in Latin, which is a same etymology of mirror, for instance. You reflect, I mean, it's reflected, right? So you reflect upon your surroundings, upon yourself even, okay? So it's also the same etymology as ad admiring, okay? Whether something is, again, the truth, the beautiful, and the good. So I think, therefore, I am simply means that for things that I'm not 100% certain, I don't know what to say. Maybe I shouldn't say anything, but at the very least, I can say that I am doubting. So at the very least, I am existing. After all, I know for a fact that I am doubting. Now, of course, more things should be said about that. What is the I that doubts? Okay, we'll leave that aside for a second. But at the very least, there is something that is conscious of the fact that he is doubting in this example. And that's precisely why we shouldn't make it more complicated than what it really is. Okay? So if you're studying consciousness, consciousness appears to be very ethereal, esoteric sometimes. And in fact, some of the comments that you posted were on the fact that uh, consciousness is made at times uh, look like it's never fully grasped, okay? as if it was something so miraculously uh, occult that doesn't matter how much science you put into it, how much reason you put into it, you will never be able to find out what consciousness really is. And the opposite is true. It's the primary thing. Without consciousness, nothing else exists in both an existential matter, so what we observe, what we feel, what we experience, but I would also say in a very ontological, essential matter, it is what it is, okay? Now, this might sound to you very poetic. Consciousness is all there is, right? Sounds like a really nice bumper sticker or maybe a, a new age, uh, cheesy uh, reminder of being, I don't know, kind to yourself and others. Not because it's not important, it's extremely important, but it doesn't seem to contain a lot of scientific depth, right? And yet, if you really think about without consciousness, without this shared understanding, Nothing truly makes sense. So what do we mean by nothing truly makes sense? Uh, I uh, focus most of the time on things such as neuroscience, neuropsychology, uh, biology, especially evolutionary biology, mathematics. But today I would like to start a conversation with a more, um, let me put it this way, uh, open-minded philosophical uh, dialogue, all right? So, both Avicenna and uh, Descartes and many, many others uh, came to the conclusion that the most fundamental thing in reality is in the consciousness. I mean, not straightforward like that, but that's the ultimate result of this, this analysis. So we cannot be certain, we cannot be certain of anything, okay, which really can be rephrased as we can doubt, in parenthesis, the existence of anything, okay, Except, except that, and here's the logical inferential aspect, didactic aspect, okay, that we doubt, okay, we doubt. So, I dare to say that this should be seen as a fact. Okay. Now, I don't say those things very often in my courses because I try to teach my students to take on a very skeptical attitude in life in general. Now, skepticism should not be confused with empty cynicism, all right, or skepticism in face or in spite of evidence, scientific evidence, but skepticism simply as the suspension of judgment until we have 
the best explanation possible for what we're trying to understand, okay? So I think we can be assured that we cannot be certain of anything or can doubt the existence of anything, right? Until, so we can put this in space and time until there is enough evidence or proof, we could say, okay? But even if you're not certain of anything, we don't know whether the universe exists or nothing, something that is a fact is that we are the one doubting the existence of anything. So at the very least, we doubt is a fact. Now, careful here, I mentioned before that there are some very bad philosophies uh, and among which I would call postmodernist, at least a significant part of postmodernism and destructionist perspective like Derrida, for instance, as among those philosophies that do more uh, damage than positive creation in the sense of knowledge. And because there is an element of skepticism, there's just skepticism for the sake of being skeptic. It doesn't really, it doesn't really provide any uh, amelioration of knowledge, doesn't provide any more evidence, doesn't provide any progress in the scientific endeavor, but simply enjoys, or that's at least what they think, enjoys the destruction of everybody else's claim, okay? I think Aquinas said this once, uh, by Aquinas I mean Thomas Aquinas, okay? Um, he was giving a lecture in Milan um, and he said, well, we can discuss about, discuss multiple things about multiple aspects of reality, but if there's any among you who does not believe that this, and he was holding it, is an apple and does exist on an apple, these people are more than welcome to leave the classroom right away. So, this is maybe a true account of what happens, and maybe it's true that Aquinas said that or not, but the moral of the story is that there are limitations to skepticism in itself, where skepticism becomes more irrational than the so, so, so claimed irrational thing he wants to destroy. Because to claim that something does not make sense in spite of a strong evidence, is in itself not at the same level of rationality, despite all the time it might sound very scientific. Okay? It just sounds scientific without being scientific. So in this example, yes, you can have a lot of criticism about the fact that we doubt, but we should take this as a fact. Perhaps what we can do, since we study consciousness, is taking apart the we doubt part. But, okay, We can do this in a logical, semantic sense. So we could characterize the we as the subject doubting, okay, the subject doubting, okay, okay, and the doubt as a verb, or let's put it like this with the action that's happening, okay, okay. Now, this should not be too much of a problem because, at the very least, we could infer, and again, I will leave more philosophical debate about the demonstration of the fact that if there is an action, there must be a subject activating such action, okay? So a very poor philosophical uh, description of this would be, everything happens for a reason. Now, I don't particularly like this quote, not because it's not true. I think it's one of the most important and truth-containing quotes ever. It might sound a little bit um, superficial in the way it's expressed. But everything requires, and every action requires an actor, an activating factor. So even at this level, we can infer that this is a really good base to start. We can doubt everything, but this is a fact for the very fact that we are the one doing it, which has nothing to do with the fact that we might be mistaken in the way we approach the problem. We might think we know more, we might think we know less, okay? We can always add to it, but at the very least, this is the uh, basics. And what is this but an expression of consciousness, okay? What is this but the most essential thing, the most essential thing we can experience, okay? So even if you were to sub substitute the we or any other pronoun, right? I, you, etc. okay? it will not change the fact that there is a subject, singular or plural, that is doing something. So we shouldn't get stuck too much on this. The element of doubt, okay, is something that both occurs 
outwardly, okay, outwardly, as in in this specific example, without the existence of something either out there or in here, something separate from us, okay. But it can also happen inwardly, okay, inwardly, okay, because we are experiencing the fact that we're doubting, okay. So the second layer here. So we are conscious, conscious of the fact, the fact that we doubt, okay, and let's call this number one, okay. We are conscious of the fact that we doubt, okay? Yes, you'll be right in saying that we are also conscious of the fact that we cannot say anything else about anything else. But number two, and this is really part of human nature, we are conscious of the fact that we are conscious. Okay. Now, if there's one thing that we'd like you to remember from this semester, that will be it. Okay. Again, I'm very enthusiastic about those things because uh, I don't claim to have ultimate knowledge in many things, possibly in most things. Uh, um, especially in the West, we have a tendency of being very specialistic in our knowledge. So. Uh, it's hard to bridge the gap between multiple fields that are extremely complex. Nobody can be an expert in everything. However, this is one of the few things where no single demonstration was convincing enough in my mind of the fact that this statement was not true. We are conscious of the fact that we are conscious. Now, this does not solve the problem. So let's simplify things here. We just leave this here. Okay. This does not avoid or minimize the problem of gradients, okay? We are conscious of the fact we are conscious, but you could always ask, wait a second, but dot, dot, dot. How conscious are we really? How conscious, conscious are we really, okay? Okay? Question mark. How conscious are we really? Okay. Because you don't need a lot of science to understand that, for instance, if you're asleep, you're not conscious in the same way as you are when you're awake. If you're drunk, if you're experienced that, you're not conscious in the same way as when you're sober. If you are in love, you're not conscious in the same way as when you're not in love. Okay. And for now, we're not talking about question of um, moral strength yet. We're just talking about differences, okay? Um, you also might be sunk in your own thought. So you might watch this whole video, but your mind wanders. So who's wondering? Is it you? Is it part of you? We talked about corpus callosotomy. We talked about left and right hemisphere. But once we, so to speak, in a metaphoric, and yet not really only figurative sense, once you return within yourself, once you return your body, you cannot by you cannot but realize if you pay attention that you are indeed conscious of the fact that you are conscious. Okay? Now, this might sound more philosophical and spiritual than scientific, but it's really the perspective that a lot of solid um, empirical science took, including in psychology, think about William James, things about um, uh, Wilhelm Boom, for instance. The fact that you're conscious simply meant that your level of awareness could be indeed experientially known, can be experienced, right? Um, in psychology, this was called intuitive knowledge or simply intuition, all right? Intuition, okay? Which simply means to go inside oneself, to go within, in or in Latin, okay? To go within oneself. Now, this is where beauty comes out. In my mind, this really bridges the gap between science and spirituality. If there was ever, you know, a rationally justified separation between these two magisteria, okay? What does it mean to go within oneself? It means to pay attention, 
It means to analyze oneself. It means to go within, to explore your secret garden, so to speak. It means to refine your cognitive process. So you're not like wandering in a dreamlike state without any true knowledge. No, this knowledge is sharpened, okay? You're more aware of it. In fact, you can also exercise that. You can tell yourself, I need to pay more attention. You can do that with all your senses, right? Let's say you, you read a book and you realize that after five minutes, you've been reading the same line over and over again. You say, oh, wait, I'm not here. I need to pay more attention. And very often this act of the will, this willpower will do that for you. You will pay more attention. You will remember what you're saying. Okay? Not always because there are a lot of other factors, but what I'm trying to say is that your level of consciousness is entirely responding to what you're telling your consciousness to do. You are aware of the fact that you're aware. And this is a fascinating thing. Now let's move, uh, let, let's continue, let's move um, forward in this sense. So consciousness at the very least is something that we can experience outwardly, okay? We talked about neural underpinnings of consciousness, okay? We can tell that at the very least, there is some level of activation if indeed your brain is active, okay? And again, I didn't mean my bias toward the brain. I do believe that the brain uh, plays a special role in consciousness in general, okay? But even if you don't want to think of the brain as an organ, at the very least from a computational perspective, you think about artificial intelligence, computer, computer interface, something that creates a sense of sequential power, we could call it, in itself could represent an underpinning, okay? something that is connected. I would not, though, claim that this is a causal factor, okay? We talked about this emergent property of consciousness. I tend to disagree with that in full. I do not believe that the brain creates consciousness the same way as I do not believe that any machine, computer, or artificial intelligence will ever be able to create consciousness. Well, of course, this has to do with the way we define consciousness as well, okay? And there are some intriguing exp experiments done where you could ask uh, chat GDP or, or any type of AI um, um, uh, software whether they are aware of themselves. And you can even ask them whether they are God, for instance, and they might reply with a variety of answers entirely dependent on the type of um, algorithmic property that the uh, software uh, creator or the computer programmer, the computer scientist, previously decided to do. Now, here's the thing. Uh, that does not mean that a computer programmer, the computer scientist, the software engineer, will know what type of answer computer will generate, okay? This is a very common misunderstanding. The misunderstanding goes like this. I create an extremely powerful software, piece of AI algorithmic processing uh, mechanism, right? And I tell the program what to look for, what kind of sequences, and what type of word um, search they the computer will use in order to create content, okay? In no way I'll be so strong, computationally speaking, to know how that will turn out to be just in two minutes after I program the software. I cannot predict that, or if I can predict it, I must be surprised. A lot of people mistake that for true consciousness. The fact that while well, the computer starts to think on its own, so to create none from scratch, this is one of the most common um, misunderstanding that is created by two opposite sides of the spectrum, one very sentimentalist and one very materialist. Okay? The sentimentalist part would say, uh, consciously or subconsciously, I am very much afraid of the fact that computers will take over the world one time, that the artificial intelligence will replace human intelligence, or even worse, that artificial emotion will replace human emotion. What's going to be left of us humans? I mention this all the time. Um, some of this, I think it's not entirely logical as an assumption. Well, first of all, let me just put this way, just because you don't like something, that doesn't mean that something could not happen, right? So sometimes you might just say, unfortunately, tough luck, computers will be better humans than we are. But this is, again, considering what we perceive to be human as very limiting, and again, a mimicking factor. Just because a computer mimics human knowledge or mimics human emotions 
even better than human themselves, he does not make that true. Think about an actor. An actor might, so to speak, cry better than you do, right? An actor might be able to convey stronger, more vivid emotion you can possibly do. Does that mean that your emotions are not true? Of course not. Even if you had any type of neurological, psychological problem that would prevent you from manifesting these emotions outwardly, okay? People might be, let's say, um, on, on a spectrum or they might uh, confine within their own body. We talk about locked-in syndrome, but they're no less humans than a person who's very verbal, social about their emotions, okay? So just because the fact computer is even better than us at calculating, processing, and displaying emotion, it does not make it any more ontologically true than the previous version, okay? In other words, I don't believe that ChatGDP is any way, shape, or form more conscious than an Atari in 1976. So this will be a more on a, on a uh, um, emotional level, right? A more, uh, in, um, I believe this way, more um, reactive uh, perspective uh, to the development of artificial intelligence and, and things like that because you are afraid that part of your humanity will be taken away from you. Okay? In this sense, I'm, I'm really positive. I don't think that we will see that in the near future or ever, but there's an opposite um, um, mistake that I noticed. This um, somewhat, not necessarily irrational, but a rational uh, positivistic view toward the future where it's just a question of time and the computers will replace us and thankfully they will replace us because we will never be, uh, we will become better and more precise as we move forward. Now, uh, you know, some of my colleagues call me cynical um, from what I'm about to say, um, but hopefully I, I don't sound too negative, okay? I actually do not think that anything major scientifically has been developed in the last perhaps, I don't know, you name it, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, maybe 3,000 years. You might say, what are you talking about? How can you say there's nothing scientific of value in the last 2,000 years? Well, the topic was consciousness, right? I'm not trying to say that we know less about consciousness than we knew 500 years ago. But I'm saying this, that the, the thing that capture our attention when we study those things are really are really a part and parcel of the way we look at the world. So when, I don't know, when telegraphic knowledge first came to be, it was marvelous and every thought it was the, the most amazing technology. And then radio came on and telephone and people like Meucci and, um, you know, developed new, new technology and Marconi. Uh, and then, you know, the, the computers, you know, came, came, came to be and came to fruition. So the Turing machine, and, and, and so the three, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the TV was also popularized. And each time this is, this is something that, that completely changed the world. People 50 years ago had no clue. This is the most advanced things. Now we have artificial intelligence. Now we have chat GDP. Nobody uses the telegraph to the best of my knowledge. Very few people still use um, telephones that are, not, uh, uh, that are not cordless. There are still a few in my family who still use some that are, that are indeed provide the cord and back in the home country, we still have the dial, you know, wheel. But what I'm trying to say is that we confuse knowledge with scientism, we confuse knowledge with technology. Technology is great, but at this point, as cynical as it may sound, there's really no fMRI study or computer science study that really, uh, that really changed things drastically. What I'm not trying to say is this. What I'm not trying to say is that there is no progress in scientific discovery. So to answer some of your questions, yes, I would disagree with some people that say consciousness is just unknowable. It's an empty, it's an empty um, uh, scientific quest. We might as well just leave it because we will never be able to understand it. No, absolutely not. We do understand more and more and, and we'll be endowed with, with scientific um, uh, knowledge because we need to use it and we'll see what the, the morality and the causality is but not in the way that technology alone appears to indicate okay so this is just a parenthesis so but how conscious are we really 
Now, at this point, we have some decisions that we can make, and the decisions are predicated upon what type of technology we use on one side and what type of method we use on the other side. So um, I will leave the discussion on neurology and neural engineering for the last part of this conversation. Uh, and I have a few slides. And as before, those slides, those quick animation should only serve the purpose to stimulate your knowledge. I'm not expecting you to remember every single um, neuroimaging process or technology, or I don't need you to, I don't expect you to remember every single uh, aspect of neuroengineering, for instance, but I want you to have a, a broader picture. So what I'm trying to say here is that there are multiple ways to come to knowledge. And using the scientific method makes us really, really good about, makes us feel good about what we are doing, as long as we don't assume that to be the only way to approach reality, right? In fact, to be honest, if you just look at from a from a historical perspective, a lot of scientific discoveries, some people argue the majority of scientific discoveries occur outside of the cognitive scope of analysis. In other words, people were studying long and hard this subject and something occurred and they discovered something seemingly completely unrelated to the topic of their investigation. And they discovered it almost in a eureka moment, okay? And this is really connected to what most uh, spiritual, philosophical, and even religious tradition have to say about this divine source, about this enthusiasm. If you remember this, this term that we encountered previously, enthusiasm as the sacred fire, right? Enthusiasm, right? Okay. So the food, the sacred fire, the divine fire, okay? Right, divine sparkle, okay? Which, which also means a variety of things. First of all, that we should not abandon scientific inquiry, okay? I'm very skeptical of suspension of uh, the scientific endeavor according to the assumption of, well, we never find out anything. So what's the point of going to university? What's the point of having a laboratory? What's the point of writing scientific papers? You know, we just discover things, you know, as a, as a, as a sparkle. Well, you might actually witness a lot of this, but you might not have the cognitive strength to understand what's happening. Things will just pass by you just like that, okay? Many philosophers, in fact, argue that there is a type of scientific knowledge that makes itself very, very big, but completely bypasses the moment. So you need both. You need solid, well-constructed knowledge to analyze what's happening. And then you need the, I don't know, the work of the Holy Spirit, so to speak, or the divine sparkle to stimulate that, that jump of consciousness, the jump of awareness. Uh, a good metaphor uh, that I would use, it's a metaphor that's entirely predicated upon what we observe in neurological terms. You could experientially witness everything you possibly need to know with your right hemisphere in a figurative, artistic, imaginific, intuitive way. But if you don't have the left hemisphere to produce analytical language, you will not be able to be fully aware of what you just witnessed. Things will just pass by you and you will not know. So are you conscious or not? This is one of the questions. There are indeed multiple ways to define consciousness, analytical consciousness, uh, metaphorical consciousness, and there are indeed different levels of consciousness. But the fact that we are conscious of that is where the, the discovery starts to occur. So, this is, should also be somewhat motivating to you, hopefully, because you might find yourself in desperation. Um, th there is a very thin dividing line between being awe and being utter despair. Um, and this happens to, I would say, hopefully, the majority of, of um, good scientists and or at least very curious people, you go to the university having some of what a, a basic understanding of at the very least what you like to study, what you like to research. And the more you study, the more you know, 
But the more you are aware, you're conscious of the fact that you're so much more ignorant than many, many other people you will encounter in your academic path, okay? And this is an extremely humbling experience. It can also be a very depressing experience because you might be disheartened by the fact that it doesn't matter how much I study, I will never get to the bottom of this, okay? Or doesn't matter how much effort I, I do, I put in things in life, I, I seem to misunderstand the world, okay? And of course, this might happen in science, might happen in academia, but it might happen in human relationship, okay? How many times you might have found yourself trying to figure out why your partner or your friend behaves in a certain way, and you see, well, I, I put so much effort in understanding my friends, my partner, my family, and I, I, I seem to completely misunderstand what they want from me. Perhaps I'm confused about what I want from that. What's the point? You might be very disheartened. And we're just talking about people. Just imagine how disheartened you might feel when you think about things like God or the purpose of life or the meaning of life or if there is an afterlife. And what, what's the meaning of all of it? The more you put your effort into it, you might feel so uh, depressed and, and negative because the more you study, the less you understand. It's a really bad place to be. But also let me tell you something that this is really the metaphysical nature of the crisis. Depression is a crisis. It's a remodel, it's a new beginning. You need to shed your old self to become something new. There's no way around it. It's the path of the warrior, you could say, or the, the path through the forest, depending what, what mythological analysis you want to use. You need to become something new. And, and I mentioned this to some of you via email. It's a fascinating path, but since I mentioned spirituality and the divine, let's call a spade a spade, and let's talk about this. Now, uh, what would be a good way to study consciousness if we, we were to think about what is the primary factor of consciousness? What creates consciousness? What is consciousness? How does it originate? Okay? So we can call this the ontological problem, okay? the ontological problem, the nature and cause of consciousness, okay? ontological problem. Okay? And and we could assume a variety of things. Uh, let me see if we can get a new uh, marker here. So, where, where is it? All right. Um, let's assume that consciousness is something can be discussed in a variety of ways. Okay. So let me let, let me let me use this as a metaphor. Okay. So this consciousness, this causal factor, let's call it X. Okay. Just give it a, a little name here. Let's call it X. Okay. This is this X has a variety of properties. Okay. And I really like you to think of in terms of how you would define, let's say, a person whom you love, right? What's the difference between traits, characteristics, and interesting factor? Okay. At this point, it's like anything that could help define what this X is, okay. So this is something that, those are just examples, okay, for the sake of conversation. This as is something that we are aware of. We are aware of, okay? And it will put an asterisk, which means how we'll see later, okay? This is something that uh, perhaps creates, uh, I put it this way, awareness, okay? Awareness, more or less. I'm going to see if there's a grade in there or black and white. This is also something that perhaps creates life. Okay, and again, plus or minus life. Now you might be a little skeptical about this. What do you mean, creating life? Uh, you're talking about biological life. You're talking about personality. What do you mean? Well, I would say all of the above. Okay. In fact, that you could also say that. The more aware we are, okay, the more alive we are, so to speak. Okay? This is a slippery slope in philosophy because it will, it will force us to venture into things such as near-death experiences and brain death and, and cardiovascular problems and the difference between us and other animals, all which can be addressed in a very specific way. But it, you could even emotionally, experientially, subjectively understand how you feel more alive if you're biologically more alive. Example, 
Um, if you're tired and you drink coffee, you do indeed feel more alive. You're more conscious. You're more aware. You're more alert. Okay, so philosophy aside, something that makes sense at the very least. Okay. Conversely, you might argue that children are overall, if they're healthy, more lively than elderly. Okay, in terms of the biological functionality. Okay, and yet elderly have more memories than children for obvious reason, assuming that they're not you know, neurological problems, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Okay. So yeah, something that creates life, and we'll see how that is, okay? Something that does not require anything else, does not require anything else to exist, okay? So that, as I mentioned multiple times, as, as disheartening as this may sound, so far, no single neurological studies, no spec, no fMRI, nothing was able to demonstrate that consciousness arises from any neurotransmitter, any neuronal factor, any brain areas. Now, the fact that it is dependent on them, it does not contain any causal factor. If you think about um, the experiments that we mentioned before, even historically, you remember the name of Phineas Gage, okay? Phineas Gage, right? The Vermonter who uh, unwillingly contributed to a lot of neuroscientific knowledge in Vermont, Cavendish in Vermont, the explosion, the raw, the pierce his skull, and the fact that his behavior changed as a result of this, um, um, this injury in the frontal lobes. None of this was enough explanation as to how consciousness originates from the brain, okay? So we can, we can put all of these things, and also we could go into more theological, philosophical argumentation. This acts, it's something, not only it doesn't require anything else to exist, but also something that contains specific properties, okay? It is outside, space and time, okay? So it is internal, okay? Internal in the sense of ion, okay? Or eon outside of chronos our time. It's self-sufficient, etc., etc., etc. Now, what do we do in science when we have this X? We call it a name, okay? Now I pick X, okay? And those are just examples, okay? We, we, we not really... I mean, this is not only comprehensive. This is just an example. So what conscious is? Let's do these experiments. What do we usually call this? Imagine that you can substitute this X with things such as God. Okay? We call this God. Okay? Now, some of you might have an instinctual emotional, very strong reaction to this. Some of you might have the reaction of, told you so, knew it all along, it was God, you know, God triumphs over scientific materialism. Or you might have the opposite answer. Oh, come on, really? This is the classical God of the gaps argument. I mentioned this before. The God of the gaps argument, it's really a poor argument in philosophy. You should remember this. It's pretty much saying that since there is no better scientific explanation, it must be God. It's a very, very, very uh, plain, I would say, superstitious in the wrong etymological sense uh, view of the world, okay? Just study more. You don't have to use God to explain something you don't understand. Just study more, okay? We don't need to put God as the reason for how electricity works, okay? And yet, at the same time, you should remove yourself from an emotional overreaction to this claim. Okay? What variable best explains all these properties of consciousness, except of the circular thinking? This is consciousness because it is consciousness. It doesn't really add any, any really uh, knowledge. It's the thing, this is why, because of its whiteness. This is yellow because it's yellowness. This is wet because of the wetness. Can we add any, any law? It's just a tautological empty form. Right? 
uh, or saying that you know this table is long because it's not short okay, or something like along those lines doesn't really provide any knowledge. It just so happens that throughout human history, this variable that contains all these properties and many similar properties put all together is usually referred to as God. Okay. And so this in itself should be something that we should consider in our discussion of knowledge. Now, some people might say, well, this is just a question of, of historical etymology. God, after all, is related to good. So, of course, this is a tautological mistake. It's like the, the primitive knowledge, you know, the, the cavemen did not know better. And so they just call it something that it feel good. Good. God is the same thing because then you couldn't know better. But aside from the fact that we have no evidence whatsoever of the fact that our ancestors were more primitive in a cognitive sense that we are nowadays, we just are arrogant enough to think we know it all. But also, it does not really create any type of logical problem to this claim. We call this variable God because usually the properties attributed to God are the same property as the highest possible level of consciousness. Okay? And that's what we do in science all the time. Until we find something as a better scripture, we, we create something that satisfies every single of our assumptions. Okay. Even more than that, because you might say, well, we are the one projecting this onto God. We are projecting, these human beings are projecting all these factors toward God. Okay. Fair enough. It does not follow, however, that we create this out of this, okay? We simply are connecting the dots, noticing that there is something that cognitively, quantitatively, and logically satisfy all this, and that's why we recognize, you get this reflection, that this is indeed God. Now, this is not an... Uh, a lesson in apologetics. If you're familiar with apologetics, apologetics is a branch of philosophy or even better of, of theology that has to do with the demonstration of uh, certain theological parameters, most especially the existence of God and how God is, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a lesson, a lecture in apologetics. So this is just a, a discussion, a dialogue we're having here. But I really want you to ponder upon this. If you study psychology of consciousness, okay, and we did already quite a bit of work in terms of what psychology is, and we will continue, and we could view psychology as a combination of neuroscience, definitely neurobiology, uh, neurosurgery, okay, um, and philosophical discussion, sociology, et cetera. We, we know what psychology is. We know how psychology studies phenomena. For consciousness, we need to start incorporating in our discussion both solid scientific theoretical models of consciousness, which we will continue to do. Okay? I mentioned to you some of the example IIT, for instance, by, by Tononin and Edelman. But we should also not avoid what's being in front of our nose, in front of our eyes from time immemorial. Remember what I said earlier? You might be aware of something, but you have no words to describe it. And that's precisely this. We use a human form of grammar structure, letters to define something that cannot be defined. Okay? One of the other virtues that we usually attribute to this infinite consciousness is the fact it's not just eternal, but it's also infinite. Okay, Infinite. So it cannot be, something that's infinite cannot be transcribed into something that's finite. Okay. Think about mathematical logics, right? If you think about numbers, okay? If this is something we did, I think, in lesson two, if I were to write one, two, three, four, et cetera, we all know that those are symbolic approximation, okay? Because between one and two, you have 1.5, okay? And between 1.5 and two, you have 1.75, et cetera, et cetera. So those are just symbolic approximation. So is God or consciousness as a term for that matter, okay? We are getting closer to truth, but we should not disregard what something that contains all the properties, okay? 
Again, logical fallacy. Just because something is old, it doesn't make it true. Okay, doesn't mean they contain a higher kernel of truth. But at the same time, there is something positive about the realization that doesn't matter how much we study, we might not add more to consciousness itself than what the ancient philosopher knew all along, 3,000, 4,000, 50,000 years ago. Okay? In other words, that type of knowledge is always there. Okay? I'm going to add uh, some more um, Abrahamic uh, relation to this. Although you can find that, you know, even outside of the Abrahamic religious uh, framework, you find that in Hinduism, Buddhism, we mentioned the Tao, we mentioned the Atman, okay, in Hinduism. But if if you look at Genesis, for instance, okay, uh, I'm going to use the Latin equivalent. I do understand that, you know, in biblical scholarship, uh, besides Latin, you should really use Greek and Aramaic. But, you know, for clarity, because it's closer to English, I'll use the Latin form. In principio, or in principio, if you want to use the arcade, era verb, okay? Which is roughly translated as in the beginning, there was, or it was the verb, okay? The logos, okay? But keep in mind that this in principio is not just in the beginning in terms of a time sequence, okay? It also outside of time and space is the principle, okay, as in mathematical principia, okay, is the rule book of life, okay, and the rule book of life is consciousness itself. So consciousness is where everything else is organized. And what does it mean to be organized? It means to create organs, okay, to create particles, just as much as you can have all the particles together, but you cannot assemble assemble a true being just by putting uh, particles together. You, you need something that creates a form. You hear informing life, which is exactly the, the breath of life. It's how consciousness entered the world and made the world alive. Now, we mentioned uh, religious perspective close to uh, either Hinduism or Buddhism or, or uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The same is found in the ancient world, in Aristotle, for instance, okay, or in Aquinas, so scholasticism, borrowing from Aristotle, where you can find the form of the soul, okay, that the soul is the what informs the body, okay. So the soul, okay, with the consciousness informs the body, okay. So consciousness is the thing that gives rise to the physical element of the body, okay? And if you want to be specific, both Aristotle and more so Aquinas distinguish that the different type of, of spirit from the soul, okay? As this higher function, higher uh, rational uh, level. So yes, consciousness exists as this breath of life, but there are indeed different levels, okay? And so we can overcome this, this debate between science on one side and spiritual not on the other side, because knowledge is the one that combines both, okay? By the way, the very term scientific as opposed to spiritual, it's something that's a very, very modern invention. If you remember, I discussed that in week one when we uh, talk about the age of enlightenment and positivism in, um, in Europe. This separation, very artificial separation, um, anthropomorphized in, uh, separation between spirituality and science, creates a new figure, a new, a new um, uh, profession, the scientist. Before that, scientists were just called natural philosophers. Okay? So people that were interested in knowledge. So now we tend to see science only as the branch that occupies itself with empirical knowledge in the lab. And we tend to think of something completely different if you're meditating in, in, I don't know, a Shambhala temple or something of that sort, okay? Uh, but there's still this element of, of authority that captures our attention. So if you go on TV, okay, depending on the cultural framework, in the West, we tend to have a very scientific framework. The person dressed up in a white coat appears to have more authority than what previously was a person dressed up in black as a priest, for instance, okay? 
uh, or an orange as a, as a Buddhist monk, etc. But we're talking about combining things, okay? Science as knowledge. So consciousness as the thing that informs life. So consciousness as the primary, uh, primary existential and essential thing, let's call this variable thing, divine thing, that creates life, that makes everything possible, okay? And creating, shaping, informing the body or matter in general also means to create a distinction, okay? So you, you separate, you guide, and you orient. A distinction between structure and function, okay? Think of it if you were a movie director, okay? You give a task to the photographer. You give a different task to the actor, a different task to the... Um, uh, to the um, camera operator, et cetera, et cetera. You give different tasks, okay? But your higher consciousness, okay, if you're a movie director, already has in mind the bigger picture, okay? Or if you are working in a factory, okay, you have the higher knowledge of how the final product will look like, but you separate function and structure if you need a screw, for instance, or if you need a rod here, or if you need a shell here, et cetera, et cetera, okay? You need a higher level of consciousness. And if you ask me, if you try to assemble an Ikea piece of furniture, you really need a higher level of consciousness, far beyond my PhD. But jokes aside, this is what we're gonna discuss next. This separation, this distinction between function and structure, and how does that apply down to the um, more minuscule kernel of human existence from a biological perspective, the cell, the neurotransmitter, and so on and so forth. A distinction that has to do with the uh, structure and the morphology of uh, neuronal cells. And if you remember, we mentioned that neuronal cells can be unipolar, pseudo-unipolar, they can be bipolar, and they can be multipolar depending on the structure and mutual relation between axons and dendrites. Um, another thing that, that uh, I want you to remember is that there are neurons with long projecting axonal processes beginning the gray matter of the central nervous system. And those are referred to as Golgi 1. And together with the short axons, uh, Golgi 2, they represent multipolar neurons such as the granule cells. Again, so gamma amino butyric acid, dopamine, serotonin, adrenaline, so on and so forth. And um, if you think about, uh, there are elements from molecular biology and pharmacology, but the, the specific techniques utilized in cellular neuroscience to investigate neurons include um, confocal imaging, intracellular recording, electrophysiological techniques, for instance, uh, patch clamp and voltage clamp and two-photon laser scanning microscopy. Um, a good way to look at this is from uh, the perspective of endocrinology, epidemiology, as well as if you think about gene expression, because, because gene expression might influence a, a wide range of brain functions, um, and, and molecular neuroscience does study epigenetic mechanisms of regulation for this, for this reason. Uh, it studies this mechanism, it studies, studies uh, DNA methylation and histone modification, and, um, and, and, and in order to, to isolate, to specify specific markers. Now, th these approaches an immediate application in the study, and it also has an application regarding uh, mental health disorder, as well as neurologically based disorder, think of it as Alzheimer, for instance, but also any, any type of uh, neurodevelopmental issues. Now, since we mentioned Alzheimer, the progressive loss of both cognitive functions and memory affecting patients with Alzheimer's disease has a complex etiology linked to several neurological or genetic hypotheses, including the cholinergic, the amyloid, and the tau hypothesis. A GABAergic mechanism, as well as a dopaminergic component, is found in Parkinson's disease instead, in, um, in the specific loss of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra uh, parts contact. Another example is the absence of normal inhibitory inputs for medium spiny neurons of the basal ganglia as a cause of Huntington disease. In the case of excitocicity instead, the primary damage to neural cells come from excessive stimulation of NMDA and AMPA by glutaminergic form. This is the same family of ionotropic glutamate receptor, for instance, uh, pain. Now, um, think about injuries. Injuries that are at the level of the central nervous system, which represent a challenge for the development and maintenance of normal neural functioning. So as cells' membranes are constantly morphing to adjust to the homeostatic processes within the organism, 
Connectivity and permeability are among the fundamental factors and functions in the preservation of health at the cellular level. What does it mean? Well, if you don't have homeostasis, when these health levels in the body are not observed, then patterns of cellular injury arises. To give an example, the deprivation of oxygen supply or hypoxation caused damage to the sodium potassium pump. We mentioned the sodium potassium pump multiple times. And, and, and this, of course, has you know, sublethal um, effects. They, they are sublethal in the sense that are reversible, potentially reversible, but they, they, they create damage, for instance, swelling. And, and swelling is, of course, a common epiphany of the vast majority of cellular injuries. However, when the cause of such hypoxic processes is not eliminated, then the damage becomes irreversible. So when a reduced blood supply leads to arteriosclerosis, cells shift from aerobic to an anaerobic state, and therefore metabolism. Uh, now, if you think about reduced blood supply, you think, of course, of ischemia. This, in turn, affects tissues and increases the metabolic acidosis with a lethal outcome for cells. At this stage, we talk about a permanent pathologic change or irreversible cell injury. Of course, any analysis in neuroscience will not be complete with a thorough examination of the influence of nature over nurture. One of the good things to keep in mind is that there, there are genetic and epigenetic factors. For instance, the arrangements related to congenital malformations and metabolic errors. Now, these factors are responsible for the morphing patterns in the cytoplasmic membranes, shape and structure, as well as receptor or the liver transfer mechanisms. Now, besides the damages on the cell membrane, injuries can happen at the level of DNA patterns. The alteration in these patterns is at the basis of misregulation of gene expression found in cancer. Therefore, the progression from reversible to irreversible cell injury arises through the alteration of the genes controlling the epigenome, thereby disabling the repair function of the DNA. In this context, we, we mentioned multiple times MRI, CT scan, and fMRI inspect, but there's a different type of technique that specifically uh, addresses um, th this flow aspect, this myelin sheet aspect. And it's called MCR, or multi-component relaxometry. Th this is a type of technology that is used to more precisely measure the level of myelin in the brain. And, and this is very, very important because it, it really translates into an improved ability to account for possible medical problems, for instance, epilepsy, including, from the developmental perspective, pediatric epilepsy, which is suspected to involve ultramyelination in the afferent or afferent white matter pathways adjoining epileptic fossa. Um, the same applies to disorders such as multiple sclerosis, which is also associated with gross white matter damage and demyelination, and to a variety of other, other uh, issues in, in, in connection to localization and function versus structure. Now, evolutionary neuroscience studies the development on evolutionary terms of the processes and structure of the nervous system, analyzing functional, modular, relational, cognitive, and behavioral aspects under the specific scientific framework that the nervous system, more in detail the can regulate behavior to the design natural evolution has put into action in order to solve adaptive problems faced by organisms. Now, in this concept, Sorry, in this, in this sense, concept and diagnostic terms such as maladaptive behaviors in psychology, psychotherapy, and psychiatry had their evidence-based foundation in these biological underpinnings. There are discussion, of course, in, 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 uh, in evolution neuro neuroscience because evolution neuroscience is in itself a, a product of, of, of evolution in Darwinian terms, which, which of course contributes to, to the specific the theoretical assumptions linking biological underpinnings to the neurological base of multiple layers of, of animal interaction. So, so in, in this sense, there are connections between evolution neuroscience and developmental neuroscience, especially if you think about the connection between process and phenomena such as mirror neurons, we already mentioned that, but also, you know, psycholinguistic evolution and language acquisition, all the way to modular processing and lateralization of functions. Uh, we mentioned Bandura, of course, social and cognitive skills, um, emotional regulation, relation, empathy, social bonding and cohesion, feedback control and feedforward control, and then, of course, self-awareness, self-image, self-adaptation, and possibly self-conceptualization, uh, including self-esteem. When we think about those terms, we can think of the two angles. Uh, so one would be a, a categorization of self. Now, by neuroengineering, we really mean neuroengineering, which is a combination itself of multiple theories, and especially from the perspective of what Aristotle would define as Techne, so technologies or techniques, technology using the, the application for the analysis, monitoring, uh, enhancing or repairing uh, neural system. Now, this has to do with uh, augmentation properties, uh, amelioration and improvement. But even the history of neuroengineering really is connected to the history of neuroimaging, because the idea is this. We can understand something about our brain 
if we have a solid um, empirical evidence to, um, to discuss, uh, or at least to utilize in a discussion uh, to prove uh, certain therapeutic uh, points, for instance. Now, um, when, when, when we compare correlation and causation uh, in the context of these neurological, these neural underpinnings, um, especially from a human perspective, we have to think about what the primary focus is going to be. And that is, I, I mean, the fact that neuroimaging is in itself not causal. This is something that throughout uh, the history of philosophy has been apparent, even before the, the beginning of neuroscience. Uh, and that is, I mean, uh, the way you will look at things will determine what you're going to find about things. This has to do, again, with the heuristic perspective. If you remember, we talked about uh, uh, double hermeneutics uh, and Anthony Giddens, and we talked about the fact that the observer becomes the observed factor. So when we think about what type of technology to utilize to understand our brain, we also think about the possible outcomes we will be able to determine. Now, in, in, the, in, this, uh, in the part of this chapter, we will examine the development and typology of numeral images uh, techniques um, and uh, we have to think about that there, there are historical factors that, that define the beginning of this field. Now, if you really think, think about the very first, uh, to, the very first neuroimaging technique, we have to think about Angelo Mosso, who was this, this Italian, uh, interesting enough, physician, but as well as physiologist. He was also a professor of the center and even an archaeology uh, professor, archaeologist, so uh, a, a, a Renaissance man by definition. So he, he also invented the, the sphygmomanometer, the, the arab graph, the, the, the hydrostigmograph, and the platysmograph. So uh, his biggest contribution to, to our field, to the field of neuroscience, more, more, more specifically to the development of neuroimaging, came from the human circulation balance, which was invented you know, by Mosso in, you know, in the 19th century. And, and this was a technology uh, which allowed for a non-invasive measurement of the redistribution of blood during emotional and cognitive activity. Now, this is very interesting because a lot of neuroimaging is still um, focused on, uh, on um, oxygenation level and, and, um, and, and blood flow through the brain. So this is really essential. Now, so what, what does that mean? Well, he, he was able to identify and analyze some of the most important variables still using modern brain imaging techniques. Uh, to give an example, he promoted the experimental and simultaneous recording of multiple physiological parameters focusing on the signal to noise ratio. Now, the main hypothesis here, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's the fact that the connection in terms of direct correlation between processes and physiological activity, uh, more specifically between intellectual or emotional activity and increasing blood flow in specific functional areas had causal factors. So there is a connection between increase in processes, okay, increasing physiological, increase in psychological, increase in neurological activity, if you can see an increase in blood flow. So those areas in the brain would quote unquote light up if there is more blood flow and lighting up means that the activity is increased. Now, so from this perspective, functional changes determine alteration in blood flow and organ volume change on a brain level. Now, what Mosso did, he, he really measured the variation by converting brain pulsation into plasmographic waves. The studies by Mosso strongly influenced research in neuroscience and psychology, especially in clinical and diagnostic testing. So if you think about uh, empirical scientific evidence for neurological activities, you have to think about Angela Mosso. Now, uh, until recently, some of the most important aspects of these studies were almost unknown. A possible exception is a brief mention that, that, that William James um, um, did in, in, in regards to, to, to uh, Mosso's work. It's really is due to the absence of appropriate translation of the original manuscripts, which, which as you expect, were, were written in Italian. It's something that um, it's unfortunately a part of, of modern neuroscientific research and science as a whole. Uh, it's important to understand that whatever we study, we study in a specific language. So it really be proper to at least be somewhat versed in other languages so you can have a broader uh, scope of uh, analysis if you can read peer-reviewed scientific papers in multiple languages. Now, of course, Mosso was not, was not the only one, and, and there are plenty of, of, of scientists, again, in the mid to late 1800s that, that, that were instrumental in, in this field. And think about Hito and Plücke and Goldstein and Krutz and Röntgen. And Röntgen, of course, was the famous scientist that led to the use of X-rays technology. And, and, uh, and another one could be the uh, uh, pneumoencephalography, which was introduced uh, 
late, later on in the, at the, I think the, the end of the first decade of 1900, I think 1918 or 1919 uh, by, by Walter Dandy. Um, others, Pereira and, and Sven Ivar Seldinger, that of course, as the name implies, was the author of the selling of wire techniques. That there are there are multiple ones in, in modern times. So if you think about the 1960s and, uh, and 70s, you, you, you think of, of CT scan or, or, or CAT, so uh, computerized actual tomography um, that, that allow for a combination of multiple X-ray images that, that were taken from, from different angles. And um, and uh, the, those 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 uh, first tomographic techniques. Uh, were really, really primitive in a sense. They were a single image and were um, first utilized in the 1900s by Val Le Bon. Eventually, they were improved the technology by Hans Field and Alan Cormack. Um, and then, and, and then you have evolution of this type of technology all the way to uh, PET um, or PET scan, right? Um, single photon emission computer tomography or SPETs um, that are all types of, of, of uh, CAT scan, really. Now, this uh, developed with, with um, a parallel, um, with a parallel um, technological advancement with uh, radioactive neuroimaging, uh, in the case of PET, by, by Lassen, by, by Ingvar, uh, Skinhoi, as well as Kuhl, Chapman, and Edwards. I'm not expecting any, any of you to remember all these names, but this is good for a perspective of, of uh, an overall uh, understanding of uh, how those technologies came to be the most important ones in the context of neural imaging. Now, um, the, the, the most famous one would probably be after SPEC, although you know, we had to mention that, that, that in the case of SPEC, that, that there are several stages of, of, of development because SPEC was, was first um, replaced with high resolution computerized actual tomography uh, or magnetic resonance imaging techniques. And, 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 and SPEC really allows for, for uh, from analysis with dynamic brain activity. But the most famous uh, brain imaging technology is probably fMRI, so functional magnetic resonance imaging, which, which produces an even better quality of images. And, and, and it has um, a plus element, has a, the, the, the advantage of being non-invasive or relatively non-invasive, and also relatively safe, it's definitely safer for the, uh, for the patient because it does not use radioactive isotopes. Um, now, in neuroimaging, from the perspective of research, it's important to understand that multiple combination techniques might be used. For instance, you can have PET MRI or PET CT scan. And there are other common techniques that are more basics, I would say, simply because of their the, uh, neurotechnological development. For instance, multi-channel electroencephalography or EEG, magnetoencephalography or MEG. Uh, and then there are other techniques that are not meant to uh, view or interpret, but to, to stimulate, to elicit a response. And this is probably uh, best known uh, in the context of transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. Now, interesting enough that th this very method derives in itself from the study by, by Galvani, as well as Faraday, and all the way to Tubini and Charletti. Now, if, if we were to compare uh, the use and effects and side effects, between TMS and ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, this has been one of the biggest issues at the center of both neuroscience and psychiatry. Now, of course, ECT and TMS are ex extremely different. And of course, you could also argue that ECT uh, being the modern version of the so-called electroshock has um, a lot of ethical, moral, and societal judgment-based issue associated with that, but in themselves are interesting because they are completely related to uh, studies on consciousness and awareness, um, and in themselves are relevant because, especially in the context of ECT, the, the, um, the, uh, the question of where we are when we are not there remains prevalent. So when we think about anesthesiology as a primary um, field before the, the application of ECT, the question still remains intact. Now, um, one of the things that I also want to point out is that there are a series of observations on observations to make. Okay, so observations on observation, because again, neural imaging is by definition observation alone. Neural imaging is truly neural imaging and thus contains images of neural activities, not necessarily those activities themselves, okay? And this is exactly what philosophers such as Bloom pointed out, all right? Now, 
which really means that there can be some empty statement when we talk about causal factors, okay? So there are two different targets. Target A is rationalism with the emphasis, emphasis sorry, on the etiology, diagnostic, and symptomatology. That's focusing on the causal mechanism, including anatomical observation as in neuroanatomical analysis, okay? So what you observe. And then there's target B, which is embodied by empiricism to connect with positive prognostic and clinical strategies in the context of neuroscience applied to medicine, psychiatry, and psychology. This has to do with uh, the very concept of pyramid of evidence, okay? So um, one of the issues is that there might be uh, a confusion between what we observe and the claim that what we observe is the activity, okay? Monitoring something, it's not this something alone, okay? Aside from the fact that our observation might change its patterns, but we cannot claim that neuroimaging constitutes the whole truth about those very, um, those very processes that we are observing. There is no ultimate knowledge seems to be the, the claim that, that I'm making here. And you might be even more disheartened and you might say, well, wait a second, uh, you, we want us, you want us to study psychology of consciousness and now you're telling us that it doesn't matter how refined our technological advances are in neuroscience, for instance, and neuroimaging, et cetera, we, we are only scratching the surface, or even worse, that the surface we observe has only so much in common with true consciousness. They are separate, just as if consciousness is the light, and what we observe in neural imaging, okay, in, in fMRI, et cetera, is just a shadow, that the light creates against a specific object, specific items. So what are we studying here? What, what's the purpose of studying neuroscience to understand consciousness? What's the purpose of having psychological discussion about the nature of consciousness, if you don't understand consciousness? And it's a very intelligent debate, a debate that can only make sense if you previously study everything else. So that's my advice for all of you. Uh, when you study consciousness, you must know the basics of psychology. You must know the basics of neuroscience. Yes, there is a risk that those basics will create a bias, a reductionist, materialistic bias in the way you approach the world. But at the very least, you'd be well equipped to understand how we infer certain things. The second question is, going back to what we said earlier about this divine nature of consciousness, consciousness as a manifestation of God, manifestation of the divine, something that's always been there, that was there, at the beginning. And in fact, I should also mention that this era is a past tense, was, right? But because we're talking about outside of time and space, this is also is. It's always present, just as much as if you're studying neuroscience, the time frame is all dependent on your type of observation, okay? You, something exists if you're looking at it, okay? And it always exists. It doesn't cease to exist. Okay, it's it's there. Okay, the prefrontal cortex that's what it does, like it or not. Okay, but if you're looking at it at a specific moment, you might have specific values of neurotransmitters, or your fMRI will give you a specific level, okay, of, of oxygenation or, or blood flow to the area. Okay, so looking at it is essential to what we're trying to to, to do. Okay, this has to do with the, uh, as we we we'll see already, the observer and observe paradox, the double hermeneutics, okay, which we already encountered multiple times, okay, and all the quantum theory speculation and Schrodinger, etc. the fact you observe something makes it present, and that's one of the other divine attributes of God, right, of consciousness, it is, I am that I am, I am the one who is, outside of time and space, okay? So you might say, okay, assuming that all the things you're telling us are true, okay, for now, okay? How can we possibly approach that, okay? Because after all, if you study hard neuroscience, you will understand it. It's just a matter of how much time you put into it, how much you study. So there is a very specific process from A to B that if you do this in sequential steps, you'll be able to master that, okay? Some of us might be more intellectually uh, inclined towards science. So we, we might just need to study a few hours and we understand everything about that specific research. For some of us, it will require more training, but we know the rules. We know the rule book. You need to study and you understand. 
But now you're telling us that consciousness is something that occurs to us almost in a mystical eureka moment life. And so consciousness is something that can be grasped by the most famous and well-accomplished neuroscientists, as well as by my grandmother, who has no academic training whatsoever. Consciousness is there. So how else can we approach that? And one of the pathways toward that is a path of realization. So we have studying, but not so we have realization, we awareness, okay? It's a very intimate feeling, I would say, and I don't use feeling in a reductionist sense this time, as if a person who loved you always loved you, but you only realize it now, okay? And hopefully, as you know, you would expect, you're realized before it's too late. So it's not so much about something you do actively, you study you do it actively, you try to do something on the book you're reading, you try to get something out of the book to put it inside of your knowledge. This time you do the opposite. You allow consciousness to enter you. You allow the flow of consciousness to make sense to you, to manifest itself toward you. So the question might be, are we as human beings naturally predisposed, inclined toward consciousness? Are we naturally inclined or predisposed toward the divine? In regard to this, one of the, well, the authors that is quoted in the text was Herbert Benson, and he described the, the fundamental nature of human beings as, quote, wired for God in connection to this process and at the base of the healing process. So in connection to the process of remembering wellness, remembering uh, how to feel good to the faith factor and the relaxation response, okay? And toward uh, health and well-being in general. Now, from a scientific standpoint, this position is validated by numerous studies. For instance, the research by Levine in connection to general medical practice and Bidakvist for nursing. Another one that we mentioned uh, last week is the, is the work by Louis Ritz at the intersection between psyche and mind, which is the cornerstone of the Center for Spirituality and Health at the University of Florida. Now, this notes that spirituality deals with what we find eternal, beautiful, meaningful, and just, and asks us to contemplate what should be. Science and technology uh, deal with much more what is and how best to predict and manipulate it. The interface between these powerful forces is of immense and immediate importance because their interaction is likely to strongly influence how the next generation shape the future of our world. Careful analysis of our debates about healthcare, ecology, economics, politics, nationalism, educational policies, and even law often reveal this underlying conflict between faith and fact-based realities. So let's analyze just real quick this, this, this experiment, although, again, I would like to ask you to, uh, to review the, the, the video to, to better understand. Okay, it's, it, th with this term, we, we can translate the concept of readiness potential, okay? So it's, it's uh, the, the, the conscious experience of volition on one side, okay? And the readiness potential on the other side. Now, in, 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 in previous elements of debate, uh, researchers such as Kornhuber and Decke were able to demonstrate that a basic hand movement in the subject studied between a certain initial nervous activity in the motor course of a subject and its actual execution by the subject, about one second elapsed, okay? So about, about one second between the initial nervous activity in the motor cortex and the actual execution. So there's some delay there. Although our human average experience is that the time between action and execution appears much shorter, so that we think that we did it, okay? So we think that we decided to activate the hand uh, movement. Now, in, in the experiment I just, just mentioned, the Libet experiment, the repeated results showed that instead that this Bereitschaft potential, the, this, this readiness potential, began about 0.35 seconds earlier than the subject reported conscious awareness that now he or she feels the desire to make a movement. Now, this is fundamental because the fact that the origin is before the awareness of the subject appears to indicate that the subject is not aware, really, okay? So this demonstrates that in spite of the appearance, in spite of this perception, humans has no free will in the initiation of the movements. And since we mentioned the cosmological argument, the ontological argument, we could, we could start with that first. Um, now, the, the cosmological argument, it's also called the first cause argument, um, or, or the calm cosmological argument, and it's, it's pretty straightforward, it has only three steps. The first one is 
whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. And in, in this context, in, in terms of the, the, the Big Bang theory, we will have to, uh, to uh, acknowledge the fact that, to the best of our knowledge, that is indeed a scientific fact, okay? Uh, and, and for that proof, you know, we have to, uh, to, uh, to thank a Catholic priest, a Catholic priest in that sense. But, but in any case, this is something that we could use as a fact for a time for the cause of, uh, for the sake of conversation. So two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Okay, so this cosmological argument. Now, if you think about, so for, from cosmos, right, first cause. Now, if you think about the ontological argument, now ontology has to do with the study of what is, study of being, okay? Ontology in Greek, right? And there were ends in, in, in Latin. Now, this is a, a type of argument that has some level of, of uh, connection with uh, Descartes, with Cartesian philosophy, dualism, right? Descartes, as well as with St. Anselm, right? Now, this has to do with this self-evident type of argument. You could sum up with, with this, like, if you have something that is contained in a, in a clear and distinct idea of a thing, so whatever is contained in a clear and distinct idea of a thing, must be predicated of that thing. But a clear and distinct idea of an absolutely perfect being contains the idea of an actual existence. Therefore, since we have the idea of an absolutely perfect being, namely God, such being must really exist. Now, this is to some extent connected to what we said earlier about uh, Alvin Plantinga, as well as, uh, as Gödel, I would say, but that's, that's one of the, 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 the shortest way to describe the ontological argument. Now, since we mentioned Aquinas, we have to spend just a few seconds about his five ways, the, the, the five ways to demonstrate, uh, logically speaking, the existence of God in the Summa Theologica. Let me rephrase this. There's no way you can possibly account for all arguments and counter-arguments against Aquinas, in my personal opinion, the counter-arguments do not have solid uh, logical evidence, but in any case, I'm doing my best to sum up everything in a, in a few seconds. So, the first, the first um, element is the unmoved mover. The second one is called, usually, first cause, which is very, very similar to the cosmological arguments, very much synonymous. Then you have the necessary being, you have the argument for degree, and finally, you have the uh, argument or proof uh, from final cause. Now, if you start from the beginning, right, the unmoved mover argument uh, pretty much is that since we experience motion um, in our world, in the universe, and, and motion means, you know, something that that becomes, that it's actualized, it's, it's a transition from what is potential to what is actual, since we have that, we can see that there must have been an initial mover. Now, uh, Thomas Aquinas argued that whatever is in motion must be put in motion by something else, but another thing. So there has to be something as an unmoved mover. And so that's the first proof. Now, the second one, the first cause, starts with one premise. And the premise, according to Aquinas, is that it's impossible for a being to cause itself, because it would have to exist before it caused itself. And it is impossible for there to be an infinite chain of causes, which would result in infinite regress. Therefore, there must be a first cause itself uncaused. Now, this has to do with the conceptualization of time that, according to uh, classical scholastics, uh, scholastics and, and, and theology is God itself simply because time and space did not exist before. The argument from a necessary being asserts that all beings are contingent. Okay, so think about transcendental, think about contingent. So contingent means that it's possible for them not to exist. Okay, there is a possibility for the non-existence of these beings. Now, in this proof, um, Thomas Aquinas argued that if everything can possibly not exist, there must have been a time when nothing existed. As things exist now, therefore, there must exist a being with necessary existence, which, in this proof, is regarded or identified as, as God. Now, the argument from degree has to do with, similar to what we said about consciousness, degrees or stages, by this time, of goodness. And think about what we said earlier about the term kalos or balos in Latin, okay? Good and, and the application. So according to this proof, um, th th there are things that are called good, and they're called good because they can they can be they can be in relation, they can be called good in relation to a standard of good, okay? A, a, a degree, a maximum. So there must be a maximum 
quote unquote goodness, that which causes all goodness. All right? So this is, is a hierarchical type of argument. And finally, the final, the final cause argument, which asserts that view that non-intelligent objects are ordered toward a purpose. Now, specifically, uh, Aquinas argue that these objects cannot be ordered unless they are done so by an intelligent being, which means that there must be an intelligent being to move objects to their ends, which, according to this theory, to go to deeper, is, is God. So, of course, when say according to this theory, uh, I, I wasn't really that kind to Aquinas, because it made sound like it's something that can be just falsifiable and it's just an opinion, okay? I really mean theory in the in the most solid and scientifically sense of the term. Okay, so scientific theory, ontologically sound theory. And again, uh, the last thing I want to mention is this: so we study consciousness, and when we link consciousness to the divine, as we just did, okay, we are using an attribution, okay, as well as an assumption, assumption, okay. But with this in mind, going back to what we said at the beginning of this lecture, there are limits to skepticism. We should be skeptic about too much skepticism. I'll sum up this in a few more sentences and I will let you go. For the vast majority of human history, as well as for the vast majority of human space on Earth, so we're talking about all the centuries and millennia past, but also the vast majority of the culture around us. The idea of consciousness as this divine thing that creates life and gives life meaning and purpose was the most important fact about life itself. Okay, It created a sense of structure, of meaning. He also removed any type of sense of alienation that we might have in our modern societies. The modern Western quote unquote world is an anomaly in human history, which is kind of a paradox because we try to think of ourselves, we tend to think of ourselves as these bright stars of knowledge that will enlighten all other theories, all other cultures in the world, all other histories, of obscurantist dark ages. I mentioned this multiple times. But we are the outliers here. And as, as beautiful as it might sound to be on the top of knowledge, this messianic form of uh, self, uh, I don't know, selfish uh, appre appreciation for our knowledge does not make it true. So throughout human history, what made more sense, it made so much more sense that it was, did not necessarily require scientific debate in the modern sense of the term, because the scientific debate is in itself modern. It was something that was obvious to all, okay? Not in the same way, you know, I'm not trying to say that things such as uh, uh, theism was always the predominant force, or there was no atheism in the past. I'm not trying to say that, but the fact that life had a meaning or purpose and consciousness was the highest, the divine power that made everything together, okay, creates a sense of non alienation. So, what is alienation? Is alienation is one of the most pervasive issues we have nowadays, okay. In fact, I will have to tell you, not just as a researcher or as, a, as your instructor, but also as a psychologist, as a clinician, that the one thing that creates more problems on the level of depression, anxiety, OCD, and many, many other psychological disorders, panic attacks, et cetera, et cetera, is due to alienation. Okay? And we are masking ourselves very often behind the very intellectually appealing scientific presentation, oh, it's due to this neurological factor, or due to this level of neurotransmitters, or due to this problems with the electrochemical uh, composition of the neurotransmitters at the same time, all of which are true, okay? This is not a question arguing against any of that. 
but it only scratches the surface. We in the West, especially, are alienated beings. Okay, we are other than etc. Okay, alien. Okay, alien outsiders. We are outside. We are not at home. Okay, we don't find this level of safety and comfort. Okay. If you're alienated, you're more likely to fall apart. Okay. And so some of you have asked me a question about how can I possibly make sense of what I feel emotionally on one side and what, what my heart is telling me. But at the same time, I need to take into account of the needs of society to please others. I always struggle with these things. It is a process of alienation. Now, if you knew as a fact that consciousness permeates the whole of reality, okay, and everything you experience in life, including all the problems outside of you, are there for a reason, a very well-grounded reason. And this reason is in itself love, goodness, truth, beauty. Even if in that specific situation, you might feel disheartened, you might feel that the task is too hard, too difficult to face, you know that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's precisely why we should study consciousness. And that's precisely why at the end of the tunnel, you will be finding the, the ultimate connection, okay? The, the square circle, so to speak, okay? So um, I hope I made my case today for this new awareness of consciousness. And I will leave you with a quote uh, that uh, does a really good job to sum up perhaps this time as a mini bumper sticker, um, the, the type of attitude that you could embrace toward life when at least you want to open up beyond laboratory science when you study consciousness. So I'll leave you with these quotes uh, and I will see you all next week. Thank you very much for your attention uh, in this very long lecture. <laughs>